Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to have you here. I'm Paul LeBlanc. I'm the moderator for this panel, which means you should hear the least amount from me. Um, but I'll set the stage a little bit to talk about uh, we're in a whole new world of changes in credentials, going from paper to machine readable, um, a whole lot of thinking about interoperability, how this happens against a sort of myriad and explosion of new nano degrees and, and sort of certificates and things that people don't recognize, and how do we rationalize the system? We've got you know, some of the best thinkers and doers uh, on stage with me. I was told that this is my first time at JSV, which um, I wasn't even thinking I was trying to date, but it feels like speed dating. I get a sense of what that might look like. <laughs> it's been good fun. Um, but that we don't do intros. We kind of go right into it. So um, I, despite that, I may ask my, um, my colleagues to say quickly who they are. I think you probably know them all. Um, but Art, do you want to start just where you are? And then we'll jump in with a sort of questions. Terrific. I'm Arthur Levine. I'm at the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Matt? Matthew Patinsky with Parchment. Paul and Zongvi at uh, Princeton University. I'm Bill Hayden with the University of California at San Diego. So Bill's the guy that gets to live in this amazing place. Um, yes. We're very jealous, all of us <laughs> from, the, from the Northeast. So Art, could you start us off with sort of the macro trends that you're seeing? Uh, big socioeconomic changes in society have in the past influenced and somehow shaped the kinds of credentials our industry creates. What's going on now? That's exactly what I was going to say. Who's, what's your okay. next question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reality is that changing in change of credentials is predictable. It's normal. It occurs periodically in the history of higher education. When society changes, credentials change. If it changes big, credentials change big. And the best way to get a handle on that is if you go back to the Industrial Revolution, and so here's a country going from an agrarian to an industrial society. And what happens is the curriculum of the colleges and universities is a 200-year-old curriculum, still the medieval university curriculum. Uh, people attend from, they study one subject a day from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. Industrial revolution happens. Higher education um, is told, my favorite, the Connecticut legislature looks at Yale, says your curriculum is irrelevant. We're not going to fund you anymore. Yale does what colleges do whenever they're in trouble. They form a committee. <laughs> the committee says, yes, we are relevant. OK, so what happens in the rest of higher education is that we go through this period of denying that change is necessary. We go through lots of little experiments. We go through creating models. Huge debate throughout this whole thing. And then what we do is we diffuse the models and we standardize the whole thing. Let's flash forward. Oh, so what happened during the Industrial Revolution? What happened real quickly was, look, the curriculum became specialized. We had majors, we had minors, broke into courses. That creates major problems. We need new degrees for all those new areas. So we create doctoral degrees, master's degrees, new kinds of baccalaureates. What we need is we need a way to assess what's going on in those courses. So we create A through F grading. We need a way to account for all this stuff. How do you add up courses? What's a course look like? So we create the Carnegie unit. And we create seat time. Flash forward to today. So we're moving from a national analog industrial economy to a global digital information economy. The difference is one focuses on process and time. The other one focuses on outcomes. It turns out the accounting system we have, the assessment system we have, and um, the degree structure we have is all related to time. It doesn't make sense anymore. It's all outdated. So what we're going to do is go through exactly the same steps that we went through in the past. And you can see we're already doing it. So what are we having? We have universities announcing, you know, for the most part, we're going to hold on to what we're doing. And what we're doing is right, resisting change. We have this heated debate about the future. We're seeing all kinds of experiments. And we're seeing models. Place like Southern New Hampshire, place like Alverno, place like Western Governors. And what are they experimenting with? They're experimenting with competency-based education, outcomes-based education. They're experimenting with blended learning. And they're experimenting with micro-credentials. If you focus on learning, of course you're going to give micro-credentials. What's going to happen? We're going to follow the same cycle through. And what's going to come next is diffusion of those models 
which will get better and better and better through practice, standardization of those models, and ultimately the creation of a new system. It's all normal, it's all predictable. It's all predictable. <laughs> <laughs> A whole group of investors who really would like more of your time on that. <laughs> That's what I was hoping. <laughs> well, you want to talk a little bit about the work you're doing at, at Princeton now? Yeah, you know, um, it's so interesting to see what's happening with the millennial generation. <coughs> They're graduating into a much more diverse and fragmented landscape of opportunity, where much of the opportunity they find is happening relationally rather than through process, and where extreme personalization has been the trend that we're seeing manifest very strongly. Students are defining themselves in unique and personal terms. And then the opportunities that they are finding and the way that they're finding them are often in completely unique ways. And so we have been reinventing our center, which is focused on everything career related, to sort of meet uh, the students on that theme of personalization. We've defined uh, a mission statement for our organization that actually has a theory of change embedded in it. We help each of our students define a unique vision for their career and their lives, and then connect them in personalized ways to the resources, people, organizations, and opportunities that will help make their unique visions a reality. We have uh, launched a program called Career and Life Vision at Princeton that thousands of members of the community have now engaged with actively that teaches our students to embrace the Princeton experience in a proactive, mindful, intentional way, where we teach them to define hypotheses, not get hung up on whether those hypotheses are right or wrong, but rather that they're just framing great questions about themselves. And then use every part of the Princeton experience to answer the questions they're framing and then generate new questions. And then our other big kind of structural investment has been trying to decode personalized matchmaking at every level. We're doing it with uh, the way that we're trying to connect our students with our alumni, parent, faculty, and staff communities, but we're also doing it in the way that we connect our students with opportunity. And we're really trying to decode matching at a very nuanced level where we're trying to bring people together on dimensions that we've never done before, shared affiliation, shared interests, and shared intent. Um, so we have a lot of work ahead of us, but the early results of what we've been doing um, are are telling us that there's something here around the theme of personalization. I'm just going to ask a follow-up question. So are you finding, do you have some system for reflecting those experiences? And how, how you, what's that category of the portfolio? Yeah, so we, our current life vision program, what's been really interesting is that uh, cumulative undergraduate attendance, 38% have been freshmen and another 20% have been sophomores. Which, um, and what's interesting is that they're using the concepts and frameworks that we're introducing them to design their Princeton experience to answer those questions about themselves. So what we plan to roll out this fall is a platform that will allow our students to track the questions that they're framing, how they're using the Princeton experience to engage with them, and then how they interact with their personal advisors, their board of directors, so to speak, to kind of make progress against what they're doing. Bill, you want to talk about UC San Diego? Sure, glad to talk about UC San Diego, and, and again, welcome to our, our backyard. We're very happy to have everybody here. Um, I'll tell, tell the story of what's going on at uh, UC San Diego, where, uh, like most institutions, it's a very exciting time to, uh, to be working and to be involved in the, in the changes that are going on, which always are occurring in higher, higher education. Uh, yet, yet there is a, a pretty strong uh, tendency to stay the same, you know, you know we, we've done what we've done for many, many uh, uh, decades and years, and, and we're, we're rather slow to adopt some changes. But uh, at San Diego, we've had the, uh, I think, the, the great fortune to uh, have a campus-wide uh, discussion about the best global thinking on education strategies to make the education experience the very best it can be for our students and to make the teaching experience the very best it can be for our faculty. So, so a rather large uh, grassroots effort on the campus has produced uh, a major movement towards in, engaged learning and engaged teaching. I work more on the engaged learning side and uh, we've been able to use that momentum to introduce some improved uh, credentialing opportunities for our students 
that will uh, that will give them the opportunity to do much like Poulin's talking about is is uh, reflect better on their experience and and even shape their experience in a way that they can carry with them when they leave the institution. So uh, we've developed a suite of tools called the uh, Engage Learning Tools, which uh, start with, uh, really start at a competency-based uh, approach, uh, adopting what are, what are probably the most common uh, competencies that, that uh, employers and grad schools and, and uh, students are looking to, to take out of their educational experience at our institution and uh, use our tools, our, our uh, engaged learning tools and the technology that we've built with it to match the, uh, the opportunities with the student's interest and then use the tools to track them. So it starts with uh, what we call our real portal, which is research ex experiences and applied learning where uh, these opportunities for internships and for work and for laboratory experiences are presented to students and they can match their interest with, uh, with an opportunity to do something that is co-curricular. The curriculum is set. You know, there's no question the students know what courses to take to get the degrees that they're seeking and that's what will be on the transcript. But this is all in addition to that and it gives them the chance to connect with the, the real opportunities that are gonna shape who they are after they complete their degree. So there's that, uh, and it, each one of those identifies competencies for the student to, to take away. Uh, when, they, uh, when they've done that, they can also uh, put that activity on their co-curricular record, which is something new, uh, relatively new in higher education, particularly when it's a certified record, which we're doing at UC San Diego. Uh, I think we're, we're on the front edge of of more and more institutions looking at these kinds of records as things that they can actually validate and certify to the people that they are uh, presenting their records to. Uh, the other parts of our, of our tool, tool set include a uh, portfolio where the student can package, uh, much like LinkedIn, they can package their uh, experiences and include uh, artifacts, include videos, include the things that highlight their actual work uh, that have been uh, reflected on this co-curricular record. And the last, the last piece of our, of our toolbox is the traditional transcript. And while we will always provide a traditional transcript of courses and grades and degrees, uh, our, our transcript is now changing to be a more contextual uh, document where embedded within the courses is the course description. Embedded within the, the grade is a grade distribution for the course. So uh, embedded within the course section is the instructor. Right now, you won't find most any of that on, a, on an official transcript. But on the transcripts that we're, uh, that we're enhancing, you'll find all of that as embedded contextual data. So we're really trying to build an entire suite of tools using technology and partnering with some of, uh, some of our vendor partners to, uh, to provide the platforms and the delivery mechanisms that, uh, that students will be able to order an official transcript and an official co-curricular record at the same time when they send their, uh, send their academic credentials to an employer or a grad school. That's it. Um, I already gave us the big picture, but you're also doing work at an institutional level. Can you say a little bit about that work? Sure. I really do believe these changes are going to happen. And we are, Woodrow Wilson Foundation is in the process of creating a graduate school of education with uh, MIT. And what'll make it different, I think, is this. What we're saying is old models, time-based, are really outdated. It doesn't work anymore. It's not how long you've sat in the seat. It's what you've learned. So what we're creating is a competency-based model, time variable. We're trying to throw out the clock. Mastery is the key. Um, you graduate when you completed those competencies. The curriculum is problem-based. Each um, problem combines a number of competencies, and you move through those problems as quickly as you're able. And we're real excited about this. It's going to use simulations. It's going to use games and other kinds of activities. We want it to be active learning with a spine of cognitive uh, development. 
We'll see where it goes. Very cool. Um, so Bill alluded to, I um, mentioned more than once, the role of employers. And uh, I would say that one of the overarching themes of the meeting so far has really been about alignment with workforce and employer needs with provider for the, for the supply side providers. Matt, can you talk a little bit about the way we need to think about tools and technology and that alignment? What are the challenges? How's that happening? Can we build intelligence into the system to start to rationalize that alignment? I think so. So you hit the nail on the head in the way that we did introductions. I think we mentioned our organizations, but not necessarily our roles. I think it's incredibly notable that we have a registrar and a head of career services at two quote unquote traditional universities, you know, major uh, well-regarded research universities. And that's an intersection that I think is, is relatively novel, relatively new, and it reflects exactly what you're describing. So the two trends that we see, one is that changing context that Art laid out, which is shifting how institutions think about the function of a credential. What is a credential meant to do? Is it meant to be an inside baseball document for transfer articulation and graduate admissions? Or is it really meant to be a currency to help someone access opportunities? And if it is meant to be a currency, are we communicating the right information in the right ways to truly make it effective? Um, and then the second piece, uh, which is the piece that we touch more closely, is digital. We cannot understate how big an idea digital is when being brought to credentials. <clears throat> and I think um, you know, Bill gave some examples of it. Once it's digital, yeah, you're getting rid of paper and you're saving some money, but we have the ability to make the transcript clickable. So you can go into course descriptions, you can go into uh, grade, uh, grade distributions. We have the ability to make it structured data. So we can move into HRIS systems and talent management systems or be used uh, by the individual in third party applications to gain their own kind of individual advice and reflections on where, uh, where they want to go. When it's uh, digital, we can not just film the play and make it look, feel, and taste like the traditional paper version, but we can innovate it. We can make it visual. Elon University has the visual experiential transcript, which allows you to see the experiences of, the, of that student over time in a way that I think a dry ledger document makes it very difficult to do. We can obviously make it more secure. We can extend it to the experiential and competency information. And we can make it more actionable. We can bring it into our online profiles like LinkedIn and Facebook or care.com or Doximity. And again, we can bring it and make it more portable throughout our life course as we earn additional professional credentials. So it's, this, it's the form and the function of the credential that I think is changing. The function is what Art very much you know, talked about. Uh, what we expect of a credential is shifting and then the stakeholders involved in reimagining it uh, are creating some really new, new ways of, uh, new forms of collaboration. Um, but then the form of it is changing as well uh, with digital and what digital can do. Um, the kind of analytics you're talking about, I think it's still some time away. I think there's phases. Phase one is getting rid of paper. Uh, that is actually the major driver. So <coughs> digital diplomas, digital certificates, digital transcripts, get rid of paper, but just, you know, the old story of filming a play, just as making it digital initially is simple in that sense. I think it very quickly with purposeful programs begins to take on a new life. And those kinds of analytics are, are clearly the next step once there's scale and good questions to ask of it. So I was struck in a meeting with uh, employers when one of them said, kind of blurted out in frustration, look at, I get degrees, I understand associates, bachelors, masters, and I get some certifications, Microsoft, Oracle, I get that. Ooh. But this proliferation, I just don't even know how to make sense of this. And the question I think arises, do, uh, do we need a national credentialing set of standards or a standards framework so that Bill's transcripts can be understood by somebody in the, in the labor force compared to the transcripts from Princeton or some other institution? Um, we know how successful and popular Common Core is, so maybe that's a bad <laughs> idea. Um, and, or is it going to be ground up? Is it going to be that you know, you've got players here at GSB who are all creating credentialing frameworks and systems? Is it going to be the best version of that wins? How do we sort that out? Because this is really confusing to the labor market. Yeah, I think, look, if you take the notion of credentials as currency further, then you start getting into questions of exchange. How do you, you know, just as currency has exchange value, how do we think about the exchange value of different Credentials, clearly, and this summit is, is the best example of it, Cre the credentialing landscape is getting more fragmented. One in four adult Americans has a professional certification or license. One in two has a formal academic credential. We think one in three has a personal credential, like infant CPR, 
or to be a hockey coach, you have to be certified. Those are more trivial examples, but some of them begin to get into professional uh, value as well. And so in this diverse credentialing landscape, when many different kinds of organizations are issuing many different forms of credentials, in any one field, whether it's nursing or technology, there are so many different pathways you can go through. It is hard not to believe that as more of these credentials are online and as they're tracked and we can begin to understand who earns what credentials and what outcomes are associated with those credentials and how do those outcomes vary across different types of credentials and by the way, different education providers for the same credential, um, that that kind of marketplace won't emerge. I tend to think the lingua franca will be competencies um, because I can't think of anything else that normalizes it. But then you get into all sorts of sticky, tricky questions around you know, who's assessing those competencies and what's that taxonomy. Um, so I think this is, you know, that's the long view. Uh, it's hard that it doesn't, it's hard to imagine it doesn't exist. It's not completely obvious to me how it takes form and over what time scale it takes form. And I think we will dramatically have to think, is this underestimate or overestimate? I think we will overestimate, we will think it will happen much quicker than it will actually happen. It's gonna take a lot longer, this is where Art and I sometimes disagree. I think it's gonna take a lot longer for that vision to manifest itself than we think it will, but I think it eventually will come. So in a world where credentials, um, excuse me, the competencies become sort of the exchange rate or the lingua franca for making sense of this, um, competencies inherently imply performance assessment, right? Because a competency, for most people's definition, is what you can do with what you know. So a couple of questions. So one is, higher ed's pretty bad at assessment, and we're even worse at it when it comes to performance-based assessment. There's almost no assessment con conversation happening at GSV, and yet it seems like the huge pain point, the huge need, if we're going to make sense of competencies. How do I know? It's one thing to claim that somebody can do something, but how does an employer know they can actually do it? And then you'll capture that credential, right? But how do I know I can trust it? Can you talk a little bit about assessment? Are you guys, how are you thinking about it? So a student says, hey, this is what I say about myself. How are you assessing that? I think that the really important thing to recognize is that individual credentials or individual competencies are ingredients. And where the real richness comes alive is in the recipes of how those ingredients come together. So I think that where there's going to be a great opportunity for us is to work with our students to be mindful and intentional about how their credentials are starting to come together and how they're gonna weave a narrative out of that that they present outwards. And then I think where there's gonna be an opportunity on the employer <coughs> side is that I think employers, and particularly with advances in uh, big data analytics and other types of assessment tools on their side, they're gonna start cracking the code on, in very nuanced ways on how different combinations of credentials correlate against success in different roles that they have mm -hmm. in a way that will be sophisticated to an unprecedented degree. So if, if you think that the big advance happening now is that we're starting to recognize new types of credentials, new types of competencies, I think that we're gonna have a, a, an acceleration of how the recipes now come together and how they're assessed at both the student side and also at the employer side. I think it's gonna be messy. It's gonna be herky-jerky. Um, what's happening is, before we're over, we have to have done a number of things. If we're going to move to competencies, we have to agree on what those competencies mean. We have to define what a competency in any given area is. So what we'll see in the short run is lots of different definitions of competencies, which will move toward a standard. What we're going to do is we're going to develop some means of assessing whether those things exist, which require that definition and the assessment tools will also come along. And the problem is we're at the first steps now. What we're seeing now is primitive. And when we look back on this period, the big developments will have occurred. And whether it's in the longer period or the shorter period, it's next phase. It's what's gotta happen. So, okay. Yeah, look, there's some, uh, there's some steps we can take in the interim, and, and I think we are. Uh, uh, you, know, you have to realize in higher education, particularly traditional higher education, uh, there's, there's a lot of governance o that oversees it and uh, accreditation bodies are the ones who are giving us the ability to issue uh, degrees and diplomas and certificates. And so, so you know, we're, we are 
falling under a, a governance process that, that's in place that is recognized across the country, at least, you know, in my experience, I'm talking about higher education. Um, but where we don't have that in place, uh, uh, the idea of assessment has been, has been in, around for a while. And we're talking about, you know, how do we know if we're doing a good job, if we're doing the right thing? And, and in the curriculum, they talk about learning outcomes and they talk about, you know, what your, what your course objectives are. Those are all, you know, very isolated evaluation points. But as we, as we move into a larger discussion, we do, we do try to adopt best practices. So, you know, our, our competency, our list of competencies are a result of, of research of what are the, what are the 10 or 15 most, uh, most used competencies. And so we're using that as a starting point. And, and I think as Art has said, you know, it, it will take a while for us to, to coalesce around a particular list or, or s some other source of, of identifying the competencies. But, uh, but there, are there are some mechanisms in place now that give us some guidance for all of this assessment. The, we've always talked about the, the discrepancy between grades and, you know, there's assessment in every class and faculty will give, uh, you know, A, C, or, or D grades, uh, but there's no, ver there's no standardization unless it's forced, and most faculty don't want that to be forced. So, Bill, once you, we know what the right competencies are, can you imagine a future where that co-curricular transcript actually carries credit with it? Because well, I think- competency is a competency, right? So if you can show leadership competencies by being captain of the UCSD football team, should that count for credit? As soon as we get a football team, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's the real hurdle, right? That's the real hurdle right there. We need a football team. Actually, that might be water easier. Polo team. You must have water polo. You're in San Diego. We do, we do, and and we we, we generally do well in that sport. Um, I, I I think it has to. Uh, the answer is yes. In time, it's got to be incorporated into the curriculum, and right now, everything in the curriculum is course based. It's credit based, um, but as we move into internship and we move into some of these other uh, non-traditional types of, of credits, uh, competencies certainly can find a place in the co-curricular side of that. I believe it'll happen. All right, you're planning for that in the MIT program? So projects, but could it be all sorts of learning? What if someone comes to your program? Absolutely. With prior I mean, experience? We're assessing teacher? whether you've got the competency, not whether you went through the program. Not how you got there. Yeah, and something that stands out is, so we've talked about common definitions and that sounds pie in the sky. It's not. Every profession goes through this. In psychology, psychiatry, and in medicine, they have the manual of mental disabilities. Each one's laid out with a clear definition of what it is and how one responds to it. It's where professions go. And the other thing I'd want to say is the fact that you're doing what you're doing is a big, big deal. Typically, the role of institutions, existing institutions, elite institutions, has been to approve, to legitimize, not to invent. And the fact that these guys are inventing what they've invented is quite unusual. It's also a mark of how far along this movement is. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, the Institute for the Future website has a great link to a little piece on um, sort of Bitcoin-inspired credentialing. I think it's way out there, and I still don't understand Bitcoin. So, but it looks intriguing, and maybe those who understand it better, but worth, worth a look. So we are at the 20-minute left mark, so I wanted to make sure we left that amount of time for questions from the audience. A lot of smart people in the audience who think hard about this. Questions for our panelists, or comments, if you wish. Anything over 25 words is actually a comment. <laughs> <laughs> That was 17 words. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen when machine-based intelligent learning is offering credentials on its own? Why would it do that? Would it sit on the beach, Art? Why would it do that? I think that one of the things that's going to be required is a recognized certifier. And indeed, I think those kinds of organizations will spring up. They won't only be institutions of higher education. They'll have to exist in the society for the credential to be real. And if that machine gets certified, <laughs> so be it. But are, is there, just to state this for a moment, is there a version of this where with, um, with sort of machine intelligence, 
um, students may do their project-based work, and that work may first be assessed by the, by the system and certified by the human being. So if you take a look at Watson's mm -hmm. work in clinical diagnosis, that's how they're using it, right? So the physician isn't out of the system, but the physician sort of steps in and says, yeah, the machine's right. Um, is, that, is that? Sure. Because we're not so far away from that reality, to the questioner's point, I think. And I think the question also reminds us that a degree is more than the sum of yeah. competencies. A degree yeah. is more than a sum of courses. And so depending on the kind of credential we're talking about, if we're talking about a particular skill area in the professional context, I think it's a very good question to ask because it forces you to look in the mirror and say, have we really commoditized or reduced the post-secondary degree to that conception of what it means? And I, it's a little bit of an academic side of me that would say, no, there's more to it. It's more the, the whole is more than the sum of its parts, and you can have all the parts, and it's not the, it's not the complete sum. Now, I wouldn't say that for every type of credential throughout your life course, but there are these foundational educational credentials that we build on, and I do think that you know, machine learning is not the answer to an undergraduate degree. Great. Right. Gentleman right here in the blue. I want to throw another assessment challenge at you guys of um, underlying qualities rather than skills. So when I hire a salesperson, I'm looking for drive and organization and competitiveness. Even an engineer, I yeah, a step that they're coming to stack is you know, a My, my thought on it is that there's always going to be an important qualitative. I, I totally agree with what Matt said earlier, which is that we've got to be careful not to commoditize degrees, but we also have to be really careful not to commoditize people. I think that there's a mindset that we get into as we start looking at entry-level jobs where we try to create a code, and kind of the same way in college admissions, where you could, you could create a code around SAT scores and G, undergraduate GPAs. But college admissions is, at many universities, a very nuanced process that has a lot of judgment brought to bear. And what will happen with people is your career start to advance uh, you know, into specialization and then into mastery, is that they will have to start figuring out where their spikiness is, where their unique, distinctive attributes are, and how those attributes come together in their unique professional identity. And I think one of the dangers of uh, kind of thinking that there's going to be an algorithm that you can somehow boil down to try to define a person is that it, it, it leads both the person being evaluated as well as the company to draw all kinds of false correlations without really looking at. So I, I personally think there will always be a qualitative element. So Todd Rose speaks tomorrow. If you don't know his book, The End of Average, it's a great read and he has a great chapter on this question. I would highly recommend it. Huh. Person in the green scarf. It so, seems, go ahead. So go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. I, I think that the, the big work that remains in front of all of us is to start to decode uh, in much more nuanced ways how correlations happen between competencies and success in different types of roles. I think that if you're talking about getting companies to start to mass adopt different ways of assessment, they will start to do that when the new assessment models start to prove themselves out and make their jobs easier. I think that the problem companies face is that they, you know, assessment of big pools of applicants when you don't really understand what correlates to success ends up becoming overwhelming and then people start to come back into little algorithms that help them to manage the process, even if those algorithms don't work well, even if they dehumanize the process. But I think what will happen as we get better with data analytics is that we will start to decode some of this and I think there will be acceleration of that. And I think that as the acceleration of the decoding happens, companies will start to adopt what works for them for the specific roles that they're doing. And if these things work, companies will, will, will pick them up. Is Josh Jarrett in the room? Josh is doing, his company's doing really good work in this space. Josh Jarrett, if you, if you know Josh, he's Bill Gates. Um, has some really By the way, just a quick response. I think we're closer than 
one might believe. The question that was asked of Paul by the employer, which is what do I do with all these, all these diplomas? We don't have more diplomas than we used to have. We have baccalaureate degrees, we have master's degrees, we have doctoral degrees. What that employer is really asking for is what we're talking about right now. That person's really asking about different kinds of competencies that don't appear on a transcript. And I think they're ready for it if we can give them those kinds of things um, in terms of what we've defined and um, the capacity to measure it. So the gentleman in the yellow and sunglasses, and then I'll go back to this corner. I think it's a really important question because credentials, you know, we think of the credentials as summative and they are summative, but they're also formative. I mean, particularly portfolios is a highly reflective developmental piece. And I think there's a big part of the program design that's very intentional to both, not to be something that happens to you at the end of the program, and now we've described it, but that's something that when you're first matriculating, this is what we are going to produce for you at the end. What do you want to fill it up with? Where are you going? And and know that we're going to do the responsible thing as an institution and track it and ultimately package in a way that allows you to take it with you. So I think you're highlighting that kind of formative uh, uh, purpose of credentials as well. Yeah, and I I'll, think that's I'll a big echo, part of it. I'll echo that and, and, uh, and say you're exactly right because uh, the intention is to introduce these tools as, as students are coming in the first time to the campus so that uh, they, will, they will see them as part of their entire experience. They'll work with their advisors throughout the course of their, of their uh, program. Uh, and and uh, they'll, they'll build that portfolio uh, that, uh, that will accompany their official records when they, when they go out. Um, and I think the, the portfolio may be more, play more of an important role in the future for employers uh, if they can start counting on the, the validity of the data that's in the portfolios. I think the only other thing I would add to that is that um, we have been talking a lot about using credentials in evaluative situations where employers are trying to find applicants for jobs. Something that we're paying a lot of attention to in our ecosystem is uh, softer, more organic connections between people, uh, between students and alumni, between students and people where it may not be a hiring process, but maybe something that's around exploration or whatever. And I think where there's great value to this kind of information is that matchmaking and that ability to make the really great first conversations happen because you know things that, from that information that help to facilitate the matchmaking. You asked a really important question. What's going to happen to higher education if we actually go in this direction? And my sense of it is we're not going to see the complete disruption of all of higher education. All the kinds of institutions we know aren't going to disappear. I think there'll still be residential places that students will go to grow up for four years. I think there'll still be research universities that are engaged in the critical research the country does. What I think will happen, though, is there'll be more institutions like Paul's. The group that's growing fastest in this country is older, part-time students. Only 20% of all college students are 18 to 22 full-time and living on a campus. That other group aren't hanging around campus. They're not going to clubs. They're not going to the gym. They're not using the site counseling services. They're getting them elsewhere. For those students, the notion of curriculums, colleges that are open 24-7, anywhere you want them, are going to be more and more appealing. I think we'll see more regional universities. I think we'll see some number of small privates begin to move in this direction. If I would... Um I would be remiss if I didn't uh, channel Martha Cantor, the former Undersecretary of Education, who was a very strong proponent of competency-based education. But she also argued that the fallacy in the do-it-yourself, self-curating my learning movement is that that's a very thin sliver of people who can do that. And the role of institutions will be increasingly to both curate and bring coherence. And this was our critic. Like, these experiences require a kind of coherence. And most people aren't in a position to know what that looks like as they begin the process. They might come to own it more and more as they move through it and mature. So I think that's an important role of institutions is to help people bring that going. And adult learners, which is, again, the majority of 
our experience, we have many of them, is that they like, tell me what I need, like I'm not, I don't need self-curation here, I don't know what the hell that means. What do I take next? Like what do I have to be registered for? <coughs> um, gentlemen, the, I promised. Yeah, so, uh, moment and question. Um, a lot of the questions around the role that corporations play in this, um, in assessment, um, well, how do you guys feel about uh, corporations getting involved in the training as well? Um, at Learn, can we create, we, we pair top industry leaders with top 20 universities to be, create co-branded online, and those corporations that we see are saying, we want to be part of not just the recruitment and assessment of, of, of these candidates, but the actual training, because we've got a lot to share with organizations or with uh, institutions in training our first future workforce. And I just love your guys' opinion on the role that you think corporations will take both in the training and assessment. Who wants to first? Matt, we start. Okay. Um, I think it's, it's a big part of it. I mean, it's sort of the Forrest Gump principle of credentials. Credentials are what credentials do. Um, and so the value of the credential is in what we imbue in it, not to be too abstract. And there are a lot of major employers, brands understand the disciplines of their organizations, whether it's IBM and data science or Walmart and supply chain management, or you know, we could all come up with lots of different examples. Part of what we're seeing with um, the movement towards digital is to an extent a democratization or an opening up and a portability of who is an issuer of credentials, who have, who would we consider blue chip or brand worthy credentials, and then we begin to evaluate and value credentials based on their performance in the ways that I think, you know, Pullen described, that we get more and more sophisticated about understanding what really is a predictive signal and what, what isn't. Um, so digital does that. It opens up more people to be credential providers, which loops right back to where we started you know, the panel, which is how do we make sense of that broader world? Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily go as far as believing that, you know, there are, you know, a view of the world that anyone should be able to offer a credential on anything. I think, again, that misunderstands the currency metaphor. The currencies are certifications from branded organizations that are trusted for that certification that they're providing about what you know and how well you know it. But there are many more organizations than schools and universities that can do that. And I, I, don't, I don't know how long that'll be true. What strikes me is if I could hire, if I were hiring somebody or I were enrolling a program, would I rather, if I were doing coding, would I rather have a certification that came from Microsoft or General Assembly or Eastern Western State College? Um, some have more credence than do others in terms of a universal standard of certification. I think we'll see more certifications from more places. Um, what we will have to do, though, is the, we'll have to test the quality of those things. In terms of for-profits, I think for-profits at the moment begin in the hole. And I think the hole they begin in is the history that the Harkin Committee uncovered. There's nothing wrong with for-profits, but it turns out that some of the initial for-profits entering the field engage in some dreadful practices so that the for-profits that come in now are going to have to prove they're better. We have this gentleman, then Ken, and then I'll go back here with our last five minutes. Um, as you guys are building your own credentials, are you trying to understand what you would want in a credential from somebody incoming to your university? And how does this I think the answer is yes. Uh, we, we're, but we're still such a, a, a large traditional, particularly UC San Diego, we're, we're a large traditional institution and the, the number of applications we get from, uh, from freshman uh, applicants is enormous. So we have, to, we have to look for a standardization of high school credentials and community college uh, transcripts in such a way that we can articulate them to meaningful criteria for making an evaluation. So you know, we, we continue to look for uh, mechanisms that will ease that evaluation process for us, electronic uh, delivery of, of uh, credentials and uh, electronic data exchange so that we can just port that data right into our systems. So for us, uh, at the traditional level, you know, we're still very much focused on, on mechanisms to make it go smoother. Um, Ken, you
I think the jury's out. I think the bigger issue in terms of cost of post-secondary education is going to come from policymakers um, who are very unhappy with the cost of it now and are asking for a new funding model. But I don't know that this is obviously a kicker one way or another. And if I can, if you don't mind, might I take a step just because I think I write about this a lot. I think the answer is absolutely. Um, you have downward pressure on price anyway across higher ed before you factor in the combination of low-cost competency-based programs because most of them are lower cost. And then you also have the, a future in which you're going to see new non-traditional providers into that ecosystem, and that's going to create another kind of competition with lower cost structures. So I, I think this this weighs heavily. The thing that will slow that impact on is that we're in a regulated industry. We're more like healthcare than we are like journalism or the music industry. We're not going off the press with us tomorrow. Um, but, but, it, but that's the whole direction. There, there really could be an interesting break point on this one, which is to say that California is going to experience a tidal wave of 500,000 new students. They won't be able to accommodate them at the University of California or the Cal State system or the community college system. They're going to have to create something new. And if I had to bet, and it's only a bet, I'm betting what ends up getting created is digital, open access, competency-based, low cost, providing micro-credentials. So we have a minute and a half left. I and mean, I promised you the last question, but we're going to have to answer very quickly because they have one of those electric dog collars around my ankle. <laughs> and I'm going to get shot. So the question. One minute, so I'm going to give it to Art because I know it's going to be quicker in New York. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about, um, there's no reason why we have to give the liberal arts for micro-credentials. Uh, the kinds of skills that have historically been associated with the liberal arts are also things that employers want in addition to the vocational things that may come with an engineering degree. And if you are a programmer who can't work, or an engineer who can't work in teams cross-culturally, uh, with emotional intelligence and managerial skill, you're going to top out pretty quickly. Those skills are still highly sought, even among CFs. So, great. Thank you so much to this panel. Please join me in thanking them. <laughs>